Today I'm going to share every single thing I learned at MIT that made me become a multimillionaire. I've been the CEO, board member, investor at tech companies that created billions of dollars in value. And this success is due to five principles I learned at MIT that shaped how I work, learn, make decisions under pressure. So if you want to shortcut $350,000 of tuition and learn how the top 1% elite thinkers operate, let's dive in. The first framework I learned at MIT didn't come from class rooms. It came from pranks. One day in 1994, MIT students and the city of Boston woke up to a police car siren echoing from the top of the MIT's Great Dome. And when you looked up, there was a full-size police car sitting up there on top of the dome. And when the campus security rushed to the top of the dome, they found a mannequin dressed as a fake cop and a box of real donuts in the backseat of the car. And the surprising fact was that the student hackers had not lifted the car to the top. It was an engineering masterpiece. They had built it up. They had assembled it up there, piece by piece, all through the night without getting caught. They used fiberglass, steel framing, other materials, and they had made sure that the car would stay perfectly steady because they had to calculate the dome's exact curvature. There was not a single scratch on this structure total precision. And that wasn't the last time the dome got hacked. <laughs> a few years later, it turned into R2-D2. Perfect colors, Star Wars theme playing and all. Another year, I remembered the dome was transformed into Captain America's shield, 28 feet across, perfectly centered to the inch. Same mix of genius and mischief. That's the magic of MIT. Engineering precision with a tinge of lighthearted humor. These MIT hacks are legendary and they started from 1950s. You know, they represent a mindset. Understand the system so deeply, you can have fun with it without breaking it. And you have to pull it off without anyone knowing about it. To this day, no one knows which students were involved. And MIT authorities never hunt down the student hackers because the hack is never seen as a mean-spirited rebellion. It's about respectful rule breaking. Smart doesn't have to be serious. Smart doesn't have to be stressful. As Clint Eastwood once said, I take my work seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. Because the moment you lose your sense of play, you lose your creativity. So how do you use this principle in real life? First, start acting like a hacker, not like a hammer. Understand the system deeply before you can fight it before you can change it, before you can improve it. And second, don't forget to have fun while you're doing it. You want your sense of innovation and sanity to survive in this world. The second principle I learned at MIT is that doing more isn't the goal. And MIT has a brutal way of making sure you learn it. The fire hose test. From the first week of the semester, they turn on the fire hose, three problem sets, two lab reports, a research paper, and a career fair, all in the same day. Google is on campus, a Nobel Prize winner is giving a lecture, a great startup founder is hosting office hours, and somehow, you're supposed to attend everything. And that's just your week one at MIT. By the end of that week, most students realize something very uncomfortable. You realize it is 2 a.m. at night, and even if you decided to stay up for the next 72 hours, you still couldn't finish all the work. It is mathematically impossible, and that's when panic sets in. You lose your confidence because every single day, you're making impossible choices, and for the first time you realize effort alone won't save you. Every choice you make is going to feel like a loss. But here's what I didn't see coming. The fire hose was never meant to be drunk from. I stopped asking, how can I do everything? And started asking, what actually matters? That's the real point of the fire hose. MIT wasn't testing for capacity, it was testing for clarity. We all must learn how to decide and where to focus. You have to learn to choose. Not between good and bad, because that's an easy choice, but between valuable and more valuable. And that skill keeps everyone around you 
focused on the right thing. Years later, when I was CEO, I used to tell my team, when I look to my right, I see 50 things that are amazing about our company. And when I look to my left, there are 50 existential fires burning. So what should we do? We look straight ahead and keep going. When you're building a company or building a product or managing your own life, the fire hose never shuts off. There's always more to do, more to chase, more to prove. If you don't build a filter, you'll mistake activity for progress. And when that happens, the fire hose will win. Here's how you pass the fire hose test. Ask three questions before you say yes to anything. I call it the three I model. First I, is it important? Will it matter a year from now? Second, is it impactful? Does it actually move the needle or is it just looking like busy work? And three, is it irreversible? If it breaks, can it be fixed later? Those three questions saved me when I was the CEO and they will save you too. The third principle is the secret behind every single grand invention in humanity's history. At MIT, every student faces an impossible challenge and it's called the P-set short for problem set. Now, these problems aren't exercises that you can memorize or go through your class notes and figure out or look at the lectures or go to ChatGPT. They are multi-step, open-ended, very complex challenges designed to test your reasoning, your creativity, and your endurance from day one. And they are hard. Some of those could take me 15 hours of work. I remember staring at a whiteboard for hours, surrounded by failed attempts and empty coffee cups, thinking maybe I didn't belong there. But everyone feels the same way because MIT wants you to learn something very different. You don't want to just solve the problem. You want to learn how to look at them differently. Starting from the first principles. Instead of asking, how do I solve this? You have to ask, what do I truly know about this? What am I assuming? What haven't I tested? What pieces are still missing? Then you build up from there, from the bottom, and you bring all the pieces together, one piece at a time. That mindset is the foundation of how every breakthrough in humanity has happened. Elon Musk didn't accept that the rockets have to cost $65 million. He broke the problem down to its first principles to raw materials, aluminum, titanium, carbon fiber. And you know what he discovered? The real cost was closer to about 2% of that. So he didn't just make rockets cheaper, he rebuilt the idea of a rocket from the ground up. I applied the same approach when I joined a large company as their chief operating officer a long time ago. We were hurtling forward with several different products. Resources were very tight, products weren't shipping on time, everyone was panicking. So what did we do? We stopped everything for three days. Not to brainstorm solutions, but to deconstruct the problem itself. So we cut down from four product lines to one. And then we launched that product very quickly to get a lot of feedback from customers. And that approach worked wonderfully. We doubled our revenue in just 18 months. Not because we worked harder to find the solution or we were smarter, but because we deconstructed the problem itself. Remember, every complex problem in your career, in your business, in your relationships, can be broken down into small, solvable parts. Here's your framework. Step one, write the problem down in a couple of lines. Step two, draw three columns. Facts, assumptions, next step. Step three, pick one test. Run it this week. Because the real power of this approach is not in solving a specific problem. It's about writing how you think about all problems. The fourth principle has been my biggest competitive advantage in life and in business. It's called the mind and hand approach. That's the foundation of how you learn to learn fast. You're expected to build the thing you're thinking about. That's how you learn quickly. Every January, MIT pauses all classes for four weeks. It's called IAP, Independent Activities Period. And during that month, there is only one rule, build something real. When I was a student there, 
we build a startup called EMIT. It was meant to connect the venture capitalists to the entrepreneurs of MIT through a private online community network. Now, we didn't write any business plans. We just built the first version of the product and invited VCs and founders and entrepreneurs to just use it. And we ended up getting over 1,200 people to join and test it. Now, of course, some ideas worked, some did not, but that experience taught us more about startups than any textbook ever could. That's the spirit of mind and hand. You want clarity in your mind? Then get your hands dirty. And this is exactly how it works in the real world too. The founder of Dropbox lived the same principle. He rode the first version of Dropbox on a Greyhound bus ride from Boston to San Francisco. No team, no funding, just a laptop and an idea. And of course that first version did not work perfectly, but it worked well enough to test the concept and then build a company that's worth billions of dollars today. There is a saying at MIT, and everybody believes in it. Nothing ever works the first time. You learn faster by failing forward than by waiting for the perfect plan. That's the mindset that turns musing into mastery. So here's how you apply this. Number one, build the smallest version of your idea. Number two, get it in someone's hands this week. One user, one customer, one feedback, one honest review, that's all you need. And number three, rebuild based on what breaks. Let feedback and failure help you redraw the map. This works every time. The fifth principle I learned at MIT changed everything I thought I knew about success. And it's true, not just in school, but in life. Everyone loves the myth of the lone genius. You know, the brilliant mind single-handedly changing the world from the mountaintop. But at MIT, you realize very quickly that it's exactly that, just a myth. There is even a saying on campus, you cannot graduate alone because you really can't. You find two or three or four other students who are just as stuck and as sleep deprived as you are. And together you fight the common enemy the oppression of MIT itself. And you know, MIT knows about this and they love this idea because they know the shared struggle against the impossible builds unbreakable bonds. If you want to survive, you learn to trust others, to rely on others, to collaborate with others. But there's also another hidden advantage. When you stop pretending you can do it alone, you start seeing yourself differently and not always in a positive way. You see, at MIT, everybody arrives thinking they're God's gift to the world. They were probably the smartest kid in their school, the local genius, someone who always had the answer. And then suddenly you're surrounded by hundreds, if not thousands of students who are just as smart or even smarter, way smarter than you are. And that's when the imposter syndrome sets in. But then, you're probably wondering, wait, well, what's the advantage in that? There has been a lot of research, recent research from MIT that talks about the imposter paradox. And it suggests that people who experience imposter syndrome often become better leaders. Why? Because when you're sure you're not the smartest person in the room, what are you gonna do? You're gonna focus on everyone else. You listen more, you'd ask better questions. You collaborate more openly, more naturally. And in the real world, that's exactly what separates the high impact leaders from individual performers. It's not intelligence alone, it's empathy, it's humility. It's knowing when to lead others and when to lean on others. So according to this research, imposter syndrome isn't a flaw. It helps you grow something even more valuable emotional intelligence. And in today's era when AI can outthink all of us, empathy is the thing you're gonna need the most to become a great leader. If you like this video, here's another one I think you'll enjoy. Thank you and I love you.